Oh, hey there, everybody. I didn't even see you come in. I think they're here because today we have an exciting adventure planned for them. You know, that's right, Kyle. Today we're going to learn about the body systems. The body systems are a very important part of living. That's right. It's very essential. You know, without the body system, we wouldn't be able to breathe, think, or even talk. Today we're going to go over nine body systems. The circulatory system. The respiratory system. The integumentary system. The muscular system, the excretory system, the nervous system, the endocrine system, the digestive system, and the skeletal system. Each one plays a very important role. You ready to go, Justin? I'm ready, Kyle. Let's go. Come on, guys. The birds breathe through energy. system is the digestive system. That's what converts the food that you eat into energy so you can use it. Now, the beginning of your digestive system would be the mouth. The mouth. First, you must get the food into your mouth. That's what your teeth are for. You use your incisors and your canine to bite the food and then you get it and grind it with your molars and your premolars. Now, there's also a part up here called the hard palate. Now everybody go like this right now. <laughs> Hang out, up in your mouth, right to the front. Uh -huh. you feel that? You feel that? And it's pretty hard, huh? Because that's your hard palate. And you know what the hard palate is for? That's to help you grind the foods along with your teeth. Now a little bit lower than your hard palate, we have the soft palate. Now, I want you to do the same thing, but go a little farther back in your mouth. That is your soft palate. That helps in swallowing, as does your tongue. Now underneath your tongue, there's a gland right here in pink. You see the gland? That gland is the salivary gland. That helps to digest all the starch in the food that you eat. The enzyme in the salivary gland is called salivar salivary amylase. That is the gland. Now. What happens after you eat it in your mouth and you swallow? What happens next? Kyle, let's show them what happens next. This is a diagram of Kyle's body. Kyle just ate his food right here. And in the yellow, we have the salivary glands and they digested the starch. Now he swallowed it. Down goes his food, there it goes. This usually takes around five to eight seconds to get down the esophagus. Now, as this food goes down, it'll go into the stomach. Now, as we get a close-up view, it just came down and it's going into the stomach. Now, the stomach is very important because this is where mechanical digestion starts and it's where some of the protein in your food is digested by the digestive enzyme in your stomach called peptides. Can you say that with me? Peptide. Peptide. All right. 
Now, after this, it goes through the stomach and then into this little tube right here, which, which is a little part of the small intestine, and that is called the duodenum. This tube right here, this pinkish reddish tube is the duodenum. Now this is the beginning of the actual long trip that your food is going to take. You see the pancreas, which is located just behind the stomach, shoots off a digestive enzyme that goes all the way out and it mixes with a digestive enzyme called bile that the liver sends out through here. So they're both mixed at this point and they go out into the duodenum to meet up with your food. This is the gallbladder. Now the gallbladder is used, like say you eat, say you go to Burger King and you get a really, really fatty meal, like a Big Whopper or something like that, real fatty. And the liver cannot produce enough bile to digest it alone. So that's when it calls on the gallbladder. And they both combine in the duodenum when your food goes and it starts into the small intestine. Now mind you, all the digestive juices that were in here combine with your food and they all travel down to the small intestine. So here we are in the green, the small intestine. Now mind you, it's not called the small intestine because of its length, because the small intestine is over seven meters long. It's called the small intestine because of its width. It's only about 2.5 centimeters wide. But anyway, it's traveling. Your food's traveling through your small intestine. And this is the longest trip it's gonna take. It usually takes between about 18 hours usually in the small intestine. And this is where carbohydrates, fats, some proteins and stuff are digested with the uh, enzymes that the pancreas and the liver. You remember when we were talking about that? That helps digest it in here. Then, after it makes the big trip through the small intestine, it moves up into the large intestine, which in humans is called a colon. Now the colon really doesn't do any digestion because after your food leaves the small intestine, it's pretty much done being digested. But what the colon does is it takes out the water that it needs from your food so that it can use it. But your food moves up along the large intestine and eventually to your rectum and out your anus into the toilet. But this little structure right here is called Excuse me, sir. Are you aware that there's protein found in that meat? Yeah. Do you know which part of your digestive system digests that protein? This isn't for me. I'm shopping with my parents. Really? Do you know which part of the digestive system digests that protein, though? You know? Well, actually, it's the stomach that helps digest in there. There's an enzyme in your stomach called pepsin, which helps digest the protein. OK. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Yeah, I was aware of that. Yeah, well, very good. Very good. You're a very smart man. Thank you. Thank you. He was smart. He knew that pepsin was the initial enzyme used in digestion for the stomach to digest proteins. Hello, man. Is that the bread you're buying there? You know bread contains starch. You know where starch is digested in your digestive system? Actually, you have salivary glands that are located right about here. And when you eat the bread, it digests the starch. And you know that after you eat the bread for a while, it starts to turn sugary because it turns the starch into sugar. That's what the salivary glands are. Do you know how long the average person's digestive system is? I forget, but it's quite long. Yes, it could actually go up to nine meters long. Did you know that? You know that it takes days to digest the food you are eating right now? Yeah, because your whole digestive system is over nine meters. Boy, that digestive system was great. Yeah, it was. Matter of fact, it makes me want to go get a tuna fish sandwich right now. Don't forget to bring me one back. I won't, buddy. Let's go right into our next system, because when you gotta go, you gotta go. Hey there. Now we're going to talk about the excretory system. The excretory system has two parts to it. Solid waste removal and liquid waste removal. Waste, 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 waste. For liquid waste removal, you have a 
an aorta, this blue area here, and a vena cava, this red area here. Blood is sent from the aorta and the vena cava through the renal veins and arteries right here. It is sent to the kidney, this orange area, where waste is removed from it and is turned to urine. Then it is sent out of the kidneys through the ureters down into the urinary bladder. That is where it is stored until you are ready to let it go. And when you are ready to let it go, you send it out through you send it out through the urethra. Well, wait a minute, Kyle. You can't forget about solid waste. That's part of the excretory system too. That involves your rectum and anus, because after you food go out of your small intestine, they enter your rectum and then they leave your anus. That would also be located right around there, right by the ureter. That bath left my skin feeling silky smooth. Speaking of skin, let's go to our next system. Let's talk about. The integumentary system. The integumentary system is the natural covering your body has. It's basically external protection. It is the outer layer of skin covering your body called the epidermis. It is composed of layers of both dead and living cells. That's right. And you may think that might be bad, but actually the dead cells are good because they contain a protein called keratin that helps waterproof your skin and protect the living cells underneath it. The skin also serves as a protective layer for underlying tissue. Your skin and the texture of it varies from different places in your body. For instance, your feet need to be a little rougher because you walk on them. Also, if you have stepped on a sharp object before, you know your skin also functions as a sensory organ. Yep, that's right. And the inner layer of your skin is called the dermis. The dermis has a broader range of functions, which include structures like blood vessels, nerves, nerve endings, sweat glands, and oil glands. You ever notice why the color of your skin is dark or light? Yes, I've noticed that. Why is that? It is because of the pigment in your skin. Ah, the skin pigmentation? Yes. Yep, the melanin is a cell pigment, actually, that colors the skin and protects the cells from solar radiation damage. That's right, Justin. Yep, you also have fat deposits underneath your skin to help cushion your body, insulate your body, and help it retain heat and store food. You also have hair on your body that helps in keeping you warm. That is right. Hair insulates the heat in your body because over 85% of your body heat is released from your head. And where do you have the most hair? On, On your, your head. head. Exactly. You also have nails and glands and other parts of your body that help to protect. So basically, your hair, your glands, your nails, and your skin, they all protect your body. Oh, I'm a big scary germ! It's a germ! It's a big scary germ! Lucky we have our integumentary system because our skin is the first line of defense against germs! Oh, I'm a scary That's germ! Right. This germ will be able to penetrate our inner organs because we have our skin! Yeah! Thank you, skin! We love our skin! We love our skin! I'm a big scary germ! That was great! Yeah, it was really nice to get a breath of fresh air. That's right, and this next system will definitely take your breath away. Inhale, oxygen. Exhale, carbon dioxide. Inhale, oxygen. Exhale, carbon dioxide. Inhale, oxygen. Exhale, carbon dioxide. Did a documentary on uh, TLC last night on the, med the medical. Did you see that? Yes, I was actually uh, very intrigued by the doctor's confidence and bravery during the operations. <laughs> Come on, we got surgery. Two, three, four. Yeah. What's up, docs? Um, actually, it doesn't look too good. It looks like there's a problem with his respiratory system. You see that? Yeah, it, it seems your diaphragm isn't inflating the lungs properly. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to operate. Would you like an anesthetic? Is it gonna hurt? Maybe for a moment. Go for it. Yeah, you should be alright. Here we go. Well, how do you suggest that we begin this operation? I think we should uh, make an incision in this chest. All right. 
take out the scalpel. All right. Right here. Yeah. Cut it down. See, move, move that stuff away. There you go. Yeah. There we go. Here we go. There we go. There we go. Oh, see, here's the diaphragm right here. And what the problem is, is when you breathe in and your lungs inflate, you should tighten this area around here being your diaphragm. And what should happen is your lungs should stay inflated. Now, there's some kind of puncture wound in the diaphragm somewhere, so we're going to have to patch that up. Yep. All right. Do you have the proper tool? There you go. Yep. All right, let's go. Right here. There, there it is. It should, it should work now. All, All right. right. Sew them back Sew up. Sew them back up. All right, there. Good as new. Moments until he wakes up and the anesthetic will wear out. There you go. Hey there. Hey. How are you feeling? I feel much better. Good. Well, that was our objective. Good yeah. job, Doc. Good job, Doctor. All right. There Thanks, Science Giants. You guys are the real heroes. All right. High five. That feels good. How are you breathing? I really Try tighten your diaphragm. See, see how it works. I, I get it. We should go for some pizza. Sure. Oh, all right. Drawing oxygen into the body and releasing carbon dioxide out of the body. It's basically an exchange of gases. Now let's talk about some of the organs involved. First, we have the trachea, where the air you breathe is transported down and into your lungs, where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged by diffusion. Now up here we have an interesting organ. This is your epiglottis. Now have you ever been eating food and all of a sudden you just start coughing for no reason and you don't know what it is? Well that's your epiglottis. See what happens is you eat food and it's supposed to go down your esophagus and when you swallow the epiglottis it's supposed to close and cover up your trachea. But when it doesn't do that the food might slip into your trachea and that's when you start coughing. Now, right here we have the larynx, which is also known as your voice box. And down here we have the diaphragm. And the diaphragm, as you saw in the surgery, is when you tighten down here, it keeps your lungs inflated so you can hold your breath. Now, we're going to let Kyle talk more about the respiratory system. Air is either taken in through the nose or the mouth. It passes through the pharynx, moves past the epiglottis, and through the larynx. Then it travels down the trachea, which leads to the lungs. The trachea in the lungs divides into two tubes called bronchi. Bronchi. Bronchi, he meant. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Each bronchi then branches into the bronchioles. Bronchiole. He's just messing up every organ today, isn't he? Oh. It's bronchiole. Which branches into the microscopic tubes that eventually expand to a thin walled air sacs called the alveoli. Alveoli. You're so silly, Kyle. You have 300 million of these in your lungs. 300 million alveoli in your lungs. These are the sacs in the lungs where the oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged by diffusion. Mm -hmm. Now the oxygen from the air can be used in the cells of your body. Mm -hmm. The carbon dioxide is simply exhaled back out of your body. When you are at rest, you inhale and exhale 12 to 20 times per minute. And when you sneeze, you eject particles at 165.76 kilometers an hour. Yeah, that's pretty fast. So you're saying if you were sneezing out baseballs, you'd be a pretty darn good pitcher. Yes, you would. All right. <laughs> Respiration isn't just breathing. Breathing is just a part of the process. Respiration includes all of the mechanisms involved in getting oxygen to the cells of the body and carbon dioxide out. It has absolutely no use. Breathing is an involuntary muscle action. This means it is controlled by chemistry of your blood. That means you don't need to tell yourself to do that. It just happens on its own. Yep. And there's a part of your brain stem called the medulla oblongata that trolls, controls all the involuntary actions in your body, including respiration. Now, we're going to move on to our next system. Yeah, it'll send shivers up your spine. <laughs> Scale metal system. Support and protection. Yeah, little system. Support and protection. Scale metal system. 
step forward and put this on. Hi! We'd like you to meet our skeleton, Grover. And in case you haven't realized already, we're going to talk about the skeletal system. The skeletal system of or pertaining to the skeleton for support and protection. The primary function of the, your skeleton is to provide framework for the tissues of your body. Much like the steel frame of a building, mm -hmm. the skeleton is also designed to protect the inner organs. Did you know your skeleton contains 206 bones? Mm -hmm. You have two parts to your skeleton, your axile skeleton and your appendicular skeleton. The axile skeleton includes the skull and the bones that support it such as the vertebral column, rib cage, and sternum. The appendicular skeleton includes the bones of the arms and legs and structures associated with them like the shoulders and pelvic ribs. In your skeleton system you have joint or where two bones meet. You also have ligaments which are tough bands of connective tissue that can connect bones to other bones. And you have tendons which are tough bands of connective tissue that attach bones to muscles. You have hinge-like joints in your elbows, knees, fingers, and toes. They allow back and forth movement, like that of a door hinge. Gliding-like joints are found in the wrists and ankles. They allow bones to slide against each other. You have a ball and socket-like joint that allow rotational movements. This includes the joints in your hips and shoulders. You also have pivot-like joints that twist against each other. This includes some of the vertebrae in the neck. The hard outer layer of every bone is called the compact bone, while it surrounds the inner bone called the spongy bone. The center cavity of a bone is filled with soft tissue called marrow. Your bones also contain calcium, just like in your milk. Calcium is essential for strong bones. Your bones also manufacture blood cells for your body. <sighs> Milk really does the body good. Yeah. Kyle? Thanks, Kyle. Now to our next system. And now we're going to talk about the judicial system. Justin, the judicial system is not a system of the body. OK, then we're not. System's gonna make you stronger in knowledge. Yeah, and you'll be smarter too. Move it, strike. Move it, strike. Move it, strike the movement. Yeah. You have muscle everywhere. Muscles allow you to move lift things, play basketball, and even smile. Did you know that you have over 17 muscles in your face that contract when you smile? Did you know that? I'll bet you didn't know that. Kyle's over here lifting weights. You know, it has been said that if you keep breaking down fibers in your muscles by lifting weights and then building them up with the protein, you'll get stronger. Well, that's somewhat true. As a matter of fact, Actually, muscle strength is not dependent on how many fibers is in a muscle. That's predetermined before you are born. Rather, muscle strength depends on the thickness of fibers and how many of them contract at one time. As you can see, there's many muscle fibers being broken down in Kyle's lifting weights. But, you know, regular exercise stresses your muscle fibers and to compensate for this higher physical activity, your muscles increase in size. Let's make a flex. Your muscles increase in size. You have different kinds of muscles as well. Mm -hmm. You have smooth muscles, the ones found in internal organs and blood vessels, cardiac muscles, the ones found in your heart, involuntary muscles, the ones you don't control, and voluntary muscles, ones that you do control. These are skeletal muscles as well. That's right, and some skeletal muscles would include the pectoralis major, which would also be known as your pecs. These help you in lifting things more commonly. You have your biceps on either side of your arm. These also help you in lifting things. 
Then you have your rectus abdominis, also known as your abs, and you have the sartorius in your legs. These muscles help you in movement mainly. And you have your quadriceps, which help you in movement. And then you have your gastric gastrocnemius, also known as your calves. They help you in walking, running, and even jumping. What's the matter, Kyle? You look a little nervous. Ah, uh, you'll get that in our next system. And now we're going to talk about the nervous system. Oh, what are you doing on your head? Oh, I guess I should get right side of home. I think so. Now let's try this again. Now we're going to talk about the nervous system, which is the system that generates coordinating responses in the body and controls bodily activities. It's basically the control center for your body. The nervous system consists of the brain, the spinal cord, and nerves, as you can see down here, and sensory organs, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Now, the brain and the spinal cord together make up the central nervous system, which acts as your body's control center and coordinates your body's activities like movement. Your peripheral nervous system is made up of all the nerves that carry messages to and from the central nervous system, like down here. For instance, if you get poked, this nerve will send a message all the way to this nerve, and it'll go all the way to the brain stem and up to the brain to tell you that you just got poked. And you'll be like, oh, I just got poked because your nerve sent you a message. And that's how it works. Now the two systems together make rapid changes in your body in response to the stimuli, which was that poke, in the environment. Now the brain is basically divided into three main sections, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem, which includes your medulla oblongata. So right here we have the cerebrum, and you can't see the cerebellum. Well actually, yes you can, it's right here. And right here we have the medulla oblongata, and right here we have the brainstem. Now, the brain is also divided into like four subsections. Like we have the frontal lobe right here in pink, the peridial lobe right here in yellow, the temporal lobe in purple, the cerebral cortex located in back here, and we have the occipital lobe right here in green. Now, let's talk about the cerebrum for a moment. The cerebrum controls conscious activities like intelligence, memory, language, and skeletal muscle movements. And the cerebrum is also the largest section of the brain. And when people think about the brain, the picture of the cerebrum usually comes to mind, which is this entire area right here. Now the cerebellum right here is located in the back of your brain and it controls balance, posture, and coordination. The brainstem is made up of the medulla oblongata and the pons in the midbrain, which are also located in there. Now this right here, the medulla oblongata, controls involuntary functions of the body. Basically stuff you don't have to tell your body to do, like your heart beating or you breathing. That's what the medulla oblongata controls. And the pons in the midbrain act as pathways connecting various parts of the brain together. Now, there are certain higher functions that deal with certain sides of your brain, which we call hemispheres. For example, lo logic, math skills, and reasoning skills are located on the left side of the brain, while insight, imagination, and awareness of beauty and art are always centered on the right side of your brain. And every organ send messages to your brain about the environment around you. For instance, the receptors for smell in your nose are hair-like nerve endings and the senses for taste and smell are also closely related because of your taste buds. Think about what your taste is like when you have a cold and when your nose is all stuffed up. You can smell very little, if anything at all. Because of what you taste depends on your sense of smell, it may be dull. Your eyes are also sensory organs. The receptors in your eyes respond to light energy, and that's how you see things. Now, in the cochlea, which is a fluid-filled snail-shaped structure in the ear, mechanical stimulation of sound is converted 
to an impulse and then sent to your brain. So when you hear something, it goes in your ear, in your cochlea, and then it's converted into an impulse, which is then sent to your brain stem and then up to your brain. And it tells your brain what you heard. And that's how you hear things. Now, also in your brain, there's an organ that's called the semicircular canal. That helps you maintain balance. And how it does this is it's a fluid-filled canal lined with hair. And the mechanical movements of the hair stimulate neurons to carry an impulse to the brain, which then tells you to reposition yourself. So when you get off balance, that's what tells you to get repositioned is your semicircular canal. Your skin also responds to mechanical stimulation. For instance, when you get poked, a nerve impulse is also formed and it's sent up through your nerves to your brain stem and up to your brain as we can see in this diagram. Like the poke demonstration I brought up before, if you get poked, it's sent through your nerves to your brain stem and up to your brain to tell you what just happened. And that's basically how it works. When he fell, oh. a nerve impulse was formed that sent a message to his brain saying, that hurt. <laughs> that did hurt. <laughs> The endocrine system controls metabolic activities. It includes all the glands in the body that secrete chemical messengers called hormones. What? We'll explain it to you in our next system. Chemical regulators, chemical regulators, chemical regulators. Chemical regulators, chemical regulators, chemical regulators, chemical regulators, chemical regulators. And now we're going to talk about the endocrine system. The endocrine system controls metabolic activities such as growth and hormones of the body structures. So it's basically the chemical regulation of your body. Now it's a bit complicated I know, but just bear with me. Now the endocrine system includes all the glands in the body that secrete or give off chemical messengers called hormones. A hormone is an internally secreted compound that affects functions of specifically receptive organs or tissues. We'll start with the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland, in green, secretes a hormone called thyroxine that regulates metabolism and energy balance, growth and development, and the general activity of the nervous system. And the little red dots you see that is the parathyroid gland located inside of the thyroid gland. This increases the rate of calcium, which is needed for blood clotting, formation of bones and teeth, and normal muscle function, phosphate, which is salt or sodium, and increases the rate at which the kidneys remove calcium from your urine. Now, as we go down to the black and purple, this is the organ found in males only. It's called the testes, and it secretes a male hormone called testosterone that helps to develop the male organs in puberty. Uh, directly above it, in the red, only found in females, is the ovaries, which secrete female hormones called progesterone and estrogen, which help in female development in puberty. Mind you, these two organs are not found in the same person, only males and females. And finally, located above the kidneys in the blue, we have the adrenal glands, which also secrete hormones. So basically, this is your whole endocrine system. This next system will really get your blood flowing! Circulation, internal transportation. 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 Circulatory system. And we're going to start with how blood flows through the heart. First, blood without oxygen enters the heart by either the superior vena cava, here in purple, or the inferior vena cava, also in purple. 
and they enter into the right atrium, which is here in pink. Now, when the right atrium is full, it contracts and forces blood through the tricuspid valve here in green into the right ventricle here in orange. Now, after the blood is in here, it still doesn't have any oxygen. The tricuspid valve slams shut and the right ventricle contracts, sending the blood up the pulmonary vein right here in green and into the right and left lungs to get oxygen. So the blood goes up through the pulmonary vein this way to the right lung and up through the pulmonary vein this way to the left lung. Now after the blood has gone to the lungs, it now has oxygen. It returns with oxygen through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. So when the blood leaves, it comes back with oxygen through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium here in purple. Now when the left atrium is full, full it contracts and forces the blood through the bicuspid valve, here also in green, into the left ventricle. Now, after the blood is sitting here in the left ventricle, the bicuspid valve slams shut and the oxygenated blood is pumped out of the left ventricle through the aorta and then to the cells of the body. The aorta here is in blue. So it's in the left ventricle and the left ventricle contracts and the blood is pumped through the aorta out into your cells of the body. Now, your heart is an involuntary muscle. This means it's controlled by the chemistry of your blood as told by a part of your brain called the medulla oblongata. Translated, you don't have to tell your heart to do all this. It does it for you. Right now, we are traveling through the streets as your blood travels through your veins in your body. That's right, and your blood has several different components. There's a liquid component called plasma, and there's three other solid components. You have the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets. Now, the red blood cells are the only cell with the nucleus, and they carry oxygen to other places in your body. White blood cells fight bacteria, and they help you so from you don't get an infection. Exactly. And you have platelets that help your blood clot. So if you didn't have blood, that wouldn't be good because it helps your body a lot. Gee, Justin, we sure did cover a lot today. Mm -hmm. We did everything from explaining the excretory system and the bathtub to mm -hmm. performing surgery. For the respiratory system. Yes. And I hurt my leg. <laughs> Can't forget about that. Yep. We well, did cover a lot today, didn't we? We had fun. And I hope you come back. Yep. See you next time in the Science Giants. Turn the tape off yet? Stay tuned for some hilarious outtakes. Did you, uh, why are you drinking a lot of coffee? <laughs> You know, the systems of your body basically make up everything about you. 
Whether it's peeing or pooping. <laughs> All right, how long? Oh, hey there, everybody. I didn't see you come in. I, I think they're here because today we have a very special thing planned for them. We do? Oh, yes, that's right. As a matter of fact, today we're going to look at the systems of the body. <laughs> Man! <laughs> Oh, hey there everybody. I didn't see you come in. <laughs> Kyle, why did you laugh? Because you forgot your line oh, and it's spilling all over the place. <laughs> I left for Oh hey there everybody. I didn't know we started. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering oh god. Dude, you're stupid. How can you know we started? <laughs> I like this before we start. No, just, <laughs> just start whenever you're ready. Okay. Hey! Come on, man, bitch. <laughs> Is that what you're just saying the final take? It? I mean, do you want me to go naked? That'll be... Yeah. <laughs> be more natural. <laughs> Through the renal veins and arteries to the kidney. The kidney is this orange area here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was doing perfect! <laughs> hey there. The next system we're gonna talk about is the excretory system. Just stop it! No, just no, sorry, no. Man. Excretory system. Right now we're gonna look at the integumentary system. The integumentary system. I just interrupted Justin, so I'll, I'll cut. Like your skin protects your internal organs. It is your first line of defense against germs. If you didn't have your skin, you'd be inside out, boy. <laughs> Speed, Parker, act, battery's too low. That was great. Yep. <laughs> that was great. Yep. <laughs> I forgot. That was great. It was nice to get a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Why are we laughing? This next system will make you a puberty. That's not a very clever pun. <laughs> Why do we have baby wipes right here? Did somebody put these over there? All right, uh, who wants to go upstairs to get the uh, muscle diagrams? Not me. Not me. And <laughs> you have different kinds of muscles as well. You have smooth muscles, the ones found in internal organs and blood vessels. Cardiac muscles, the ones found in your heart. Involuntary muscles, the ones you don't control and voluntary muscles. Ones that control by you. <laughs> <laughs> Suck. Ones that control by you. I'll be an outtake. Transportation, circulation, internal transportation. 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 He's not doing anything. He <laughs> 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 looks so angry. Kyle? Thanks, Kyle. You, the computer's in the way. Hold up a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tina, don't let her. Thanks, Kyle. Kyle, contain oxygen and they bring it to different parts of your body. And that's Eric's cell phone. And it's <laughs> ringing. Eject particles at 165.76 kilometers an hour. Did you know that? I bet you didn't know that. So if you were sneezing baseballs, you're pretty, pretty darn good pitcher. Respiration. <laughs> <laughs> going on here? Oh! <laughs> Our next system is the nervous system. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. Ah! 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 Let's try this again. Now we're gonna wait. Stop. The brain is also divided into like four subsections, like the parental lobe, the 
Can we just go ahead? For instance, think about what your taste is like when you have a cold and when your nose is all stuffed up. You can smell very little, if anything at all. Man! That person back. No, it's okay, I'm right. We said we were in the finish this today. Oh, straight out. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm filming, guys. Your sensory organs send messages to your brain about semicircular canals help you maintain balance. And, and it's located at the base of your brain. That's where your semicircular canals are located. And they're lined with fluid filled canal with ha hair. <laughs> right? Your sensory organs send messages to your brain about the environment around you. For the stop man! <laughs> Sensory organs send messages to the brain, which then tells you to reposition yourself. So when you get off balance, that's what tells you to get repositioned is your semicircular canal. And like the car, like the ear, the skin, like the ear, the skin also responds to mechanical stimulation. Dang it. <laughs> Reading, I'm pointing. No, you're. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to hold it? No, I'm, I'm the pointer. I'm the pointer. I, you're reading. How can you be a pointer? I'm the pointer. But I got the pull out. No. Why? You got out. You got to take the bath. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like you did for you because, you know, you did a scene all the yourself. See, doesn't that make sense? <laughs> Why don't you just tape it? <laughs> oh, yeah. I forgot that happened. Mom, <laughs> I mean to hold it? No. Oh, this is fine. Leave. How can you hold it? Can you please leave? It, like, distracts us. We'll be fine, dude. I believe. Yeah. No, I liked it better than the other one. It distracts us. Why does it matter what? <laughs> oh, here's something you can hold that on. Oh, boy. Oh, why boy. Would I, why would I do that when I can do this? <laughs> All right. We'd like you to meet Grover, our skeleton. And now we're going to talk about Bigfoot. Okay. Bigfoot. 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 Bigfoot.
Why are you still watching? It's over. It's over. It's done. This is the end. That's it. <laughs> People have a long attention span. Yeah, I know. <laughs> turn off the tape now. We're done. Please turn the tape off. It's, it should be the largest button on your television monitor. It, sh it should say it. stop. Boom, boom, there it is. And it'll stop. There you go. It's over. Did mm, pal right here. Remember that? that was <laughs> yeah. 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 Woo. R.I.P. Grover. You. Yeah. yeah, Grover. We love you.